On behalf of the Oxford Students Area Medical Society, it's an enormous privilege and a great pleasure to welcome you to this very special opening lecture. Tonight we mark 10 years of this really impressive week in Oxford with a hero of the struggle and it's a pride in South Africa. In honor of Chris Goldberg, a man who has devoted his life to the cause of freedom and justice, the Arab Medical Society is joined by Oxford Jewish Students for Justice in Palestine, Oxford Students for Palestine. Oxford University Africa Society, Oxford University Amnesty International Society, Oxford Palestine Solidarity Campaign, Oxford Radical Forum, RS21, Oxford Pan African Forum, and the Oxford Campaign for Racial Awareness and Equality. Since being launched by a small group of students in Toronto in 2004, it's really a pride that can spread to over 200 cities and campuses worldwide. The purpose of this really a pride remains clear to stimulate debate raise awareness of Israel as an apartheid system, and to build support for the growing movement of boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Israeli Apartheid Week in Oxford continues on Monday evening, running through six week until Saturday. For more information about the week's events, please refer to the flyers on your seats, or visit apartheidweek.org forward slash Oxford. Tonight we celebrate a long tradition of joint struggle for freedom. The exhibition that you will have seen on your way in features a small selection of posters from the anti-apartheid movement, the Palestinian liberation movement, in addition to the history of solidarity between them. We are also privileged to have one of the university's most distinguished political historians chairing the evening's lecture. Dr. Sudhir Hazari Singh is a CUF lecturer and tutorial fellow at Yale College and is a fellow of the British Academy. His many publications on French political history have won the international acclaim. His The Legend of Napoleon received the Prix de Soie of the Fondation Napoleon in 2010, and The Shadow of the General, a political study of Charles de Gaulle, was awarded the History Prize by the French Senate. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sylvia Hazelis. Thank you very much for that warm introduction, Nadia, and uh, it's my great honor and privilege to uh, be here with you to give a welcome to Dennis Goldberg, who's going to be launching the Oxford uh, Israel Apartheid Week 2015. <coughs> Dennis, as Nadia has just said, is a living legend. Um, he's devoted his life to the struggle for freedom from apartheid and freedom uh, and for democracy in South Africa and also uh, against intolerance and discrimination everywhere in the world. Uh, Dennis was active in a number of associations uh, working alongside the ANC against apartheid right from the early 1950s when he studied civil engineering uh, at the University of Cape Town. He was one of the organizers of the People's Congress which adopted the Freedom Charter, um, the central programmatic document for the anti-apartheid struggle. In 1957, um, Dennis joined the Communist Party, and a few years later, he became a member of the military wing of the ANC, the spear of the nation. Uh, he was its logistics and technical officer. Dennis was then arrested in 1963, and was one of the eight men sentenced uh, in 1964 to life imprisonment at the famous Rivoli trial uh, for conspiracy to overthrow the apartheid South African state. Among the others, as you all know, of course, uh, were Nelson Mandela, Walter Sisulu, Gohan uh, Mbeki, and Ahmed Katrava. Dennis was released in 1985 and went into exile, serving as the ANC uh, spokesperson in Britain, in Europe, in Scandinavia, in Canada, uh, in the United States, and also at the United Nations. He returned to South Africa in 2002, um, and served as an advisor to two ministries, uh, Water and Forestry, if I'm correct, um, and continued to work tirelessly uh, towards improving the lives of South African citizens. Dennis has always been uh, a friend and an ardent supporter of the Palestinian people. Um, he repeatedly denounced their dispossession, their occupation, their colonial oppression, and their exclusion from full citizenship and he has spoken eloquently since his youth about the parallels between apartheid South Africa and the current predicament of 
faced by Palestinians in the state of Israel. And um, without going too much into the history, um, I also wanted to uh, say something about the historic relationship between the ANC and the PLO. The ANC and the PLO were always very closely allied. Nelson Mandela once said, uh, and I quote, we know too well that our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians. And, and you can get a measure of this historic relationship in the exhibition, which uh, Nadia has pointed out to you. And if you haven't had a chance to do it, please do so on your way out. Uh, on your way out, you will also be able to buy a copy of this remarkable book about Dennis, um, Dennis Goldberg, Freedom Fighter and Humanist, which is on sale uh, outside for 10 pounds. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, Dennis uh, is going to talk uh, more particularly about um, one of the themes which is actually illustrated in, in the exhibition, which is political imprisonment. Um, there are present thousands of Palestinians in, in Israeli jails, and like the South African freedom fighters, these young men and women. Oh, thank you, Albert. <laughs> Timely intervention as usual from Albert. Um, these young men and women pay a very high price every day um, in desperate conditions uh, for standing up for their freedom. As someone who has served more than two decades in the apartheid regime's jail, Dennis knows uh, exactly uh, what this means, and this is what he's going to speak about today. So, dear friends, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dennis. The title of this talk is The Prisoner's Struggle from South Africa to Palestine. Good evening, everybody, and especially to the host organizations. And I'm impressed that so many organizations can actually get together and do something together. Uh, it's quite a remarkable achievement. I congratulate you on it. Uh, that's a way of calming my nerves because I walked into examination schools and I felt dreadful. <laughs> Am I sitting in the exam here, for God's sake? <laughs> um, I'm going to stay sitting down, uh, one standing for a long time, and I'm going to talk for a long time. Uh, it's not so easy for me. Secondly, I did study law in prison, but I only have half a law degree. Lawyers stand to talk, I will sit. Uh, only half a lawyer. Very useful half of a lawyer, because in prison in South Africa, we were forbidden contact with the outside world for 16 years. No newspapers, no radio broadcasts, there was no television. Sometimes we could smuggle newspapers, sometimes there was a symp sympathetic warder who would bring a newspaper to me and I could then share it with my comrades in prison. And sometimes, because there was apartheid in the prisons and I was in a prison for white political prisoners only. There were a small number of us. But we were able in apartheid South Africa to whisper to black prisoners who were brought in sometimes to paint the prison or to empty refuse bins and clean up and so on that we needed newspapers and they would put newspapers into the refuse bin we would take them out we would put in tobacco, tobacco is the universal currency in prison. But on one occasion with a painting team there, we had flooded the market for tobacco and the value had been reduced. You know, good money drives out bad. <laughs> so uh, I studied economics as well. And uh, we had to use toilet articles. And we had too much palm olive soap, so they wanted Knights Castile and when that, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera because African prisoners were hardly well looked after, not provided with toilet articles at all, or very little of it, and were desperate for something that was nice. Uh, white political prisoners did have advantages in diet, in uh, various facilities that we had, 
But one thing, I'm talking about criminal prisoners now, but there's a kind of automatic solidarity between prisoners. It's us against them. Um, let me go back a bit to being arrested in 1960. And we always, it was a state of emergency after the, the Sharpeville massacre. A number of us were arrested and we would be taken through the prison or the police cells by police officers who would shout, here come the white Africans, because everywhere we went we said, Africa, my we are Africa, my... And the black criminal prisoners looked at us as though we were absolutely crazy, I have to admit. It's not always easy to be on the side of the people who don't always understand what you're doing. But in the prison, the main prison after we were sentenced, you heard we were sentenced in the Ravonia trial. Uh, I divert sometimes, you know. And, uh, the story comes together in the end. I'm sure. Uh, we were sentenced actually to four life sentences and I have to say that beats the four death sentences that we expected, uh, really and truly. Uh, Nelson Mandela and Walter Sisulu had prepared speeches in the event of being warned of being sentenced to death. I discovered quite recently in an interview conducted by Nick Sadler and Worthy uh, with my comrade, he's at the back there, uh, we were in the court where we were tried with my comrade Andrew Mlangeni, one of the three survivors, Andrew uh, uh, Ahmed Kasrade being the third, now that Nelson has died. Uh, and Andrew said, in answer to next question, were you, sh were you relieved when you were sentenced to life imprisonment? He said, no, he was shocked. Because the lawyers thought he would only be sentenced to 12 years of imprisonment. And then he went on and said, but the lawyers had said, maybe Nelson and Walter will be sentenced to death, but Dennis will probably, will almost certainly be. And the reasoning and the analysis was that if Nelson was sentenced to death, there could be well an uprising by our people who would be absolutely outraged. If Dennis were sentenced to death and it were carried out, there would be anger, but not an uprising. That's the nature of apartheid in South Africa. People would be saddened, they would say, what a hero, he died for us, but they wouldn't have risen up to sweep away the apartheid government. I agree with that analysis, and uh, uh, I'm quite relieved and able to report that they were life sentences. And I have to say as well, you know, uh, my name's Goldberg, I come from a Jewish trading background, you know. Uh, I got a 75% discount. <laughs> I only served one life sentence. <laughs> <laughs> and in a sense, I'm trying to tell you that one way of dealing with this kind of adversity is to laugh at your own seriousness and your own absurdity and to just get on with it day after day after day after day after day for 7,904 days. Um, in fact, there's a, a, a marble, looks like a tombstone, one of a number of them at the bottom end of our constitutional court, one for each of us sentenced to life in prison for the mark for each day we served. I'm quite proud to be there with Nelson Mandela, Walter Sassoula, and the others you mentioned. Um, and you don't do it for recognition, you do it because you have to do it. The title is, what's the title? Uh, Political Prisoners from Apartheid to Palestine. Hmm? And the question is, why does one get taken to prison? You don't go to prison, you get taken to prison. Unless you're Mahatma Gandhi who invites it. We were determined to stay out of prison, not very successfully. We were amateurs at the underground game. But you have to make the break at some point between legality and semi-legality and ducking and diving and making the choice to combat this evil, brutal system of racism by law that was apartheid. With increasing terror, increasing imprisonment and beatings and killings of people who protested until after the Sharpeville massacre, 
Our people said, you can't go on calling on us to protest when it results in imprisonment and death. You have to be able to protect us. Nelson Mandela and Joe Slova of the Communist Party and others agreed that we needed an armed struggle, discussed it quite widely, travelled the country discussing it. Nelson Mandela left the country illegally without a passport to consult with African leaders throughout Africa, eventually returned, uh, travelled round South Africa reporting to little meetings of leading people. I was one of them in Cape Town. <coughs> And I remember saying to him, what are the aims of this armed struggle? And he said, well, one person, one vote. Uh, as against the system of apartheid where African people had no votes. Coloured people had some kind of rights, but no votes by then, and Indian people also, people of Indian extraction. And if I use the language of apartheid racism, it's because these are the way people were named by law, and the terms still continue and you can't understand South Africa unless you call people by the terms that we understand. Because racism isn't dead. We have a constitution which outlaws it, but laws don't change mindsets. That's going to take generations, sadly.